Buenas noches. Buenas noches. <ríe> Qué gusto. Uh, reciban todos nuestra más calurosa bienvenida. We begin with a land acknowledgement. As part of Loyola Marymount University's recognition of our history, location, and relationship to the indigenous communities in Los Angeles, we acknowledge the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands, and the presence of LMU on this traditional ancestral and unceded land. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, study, create, and to be in this place. Los Angeles has the largest indigenous population of any metropolitan area in the United States, including many diasporic communities from Latin America, in particular, the Oaxaca region of Mexico, which have their own history of struggle and resiliency. Indigenous identity is as much a part of our present and future as our past. Good evening and welcome everyone to the 2023 Hispanic Ministry and Theology Lecture to be delivered tonight by Dr. Austin Ivory, entitled Strangers into Siblings, Pope Francis on Migration. Welcome also to those viewing on the live stream and to English and Spanish speakers alike. This is a bilingual event. For those viewing on Zoom webinar, please use the interpretation feature. And for those here in the room, translations will be projected on the screen or during the Q&A available over the phone. You will find instructions for that on the back of your program. Este es un evento bilingüe para aquellos presentes a través de Zoom webinar favor de utilizar la función de interpretación. Para los que están presentes aquí en el auditorio, las traducciones se proyectarán sobre la pantalla o durante la sesión de preguntas y respuestas estarán disponibles por teléfono. Las instrucciones se encuentran en la parte posterior de su programa. One more housekeeping item. After the lecture, we will have a time for questions and those online will be able to use the Q&A function to submit their questions. Those here in the auditorium can use the three by five cards that have been distributed to you as you came in. I'm Ruben Martinez, a professor. Let me pronounce my own name better than that. I'm Ruben Martinez. It's, you know, the Chicano syndrome. You never know which side you're going to be on. I am Ruben Martinez, a professor in the departments of Chicana, Chicano, Latino, Latina studies, English and journalism. I'm honored to be part of this event, which is focused on a theme so central to my sense of self that I cannot imagine my identity without it. I am the son and grandson of immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador, which means there's an eternal struggle in my soul between tacos and pupusas. For millions of people the world over, the experience of migration is both intimate and devastatingly public. It is often, we must remind ourselves again and again, a matter of life and death, and always, always a matter of morality. The Hispanic Ministry and Theology Lecture is organized annually by the LMU Latino Latina Theology and Ministry Initiative, which emerged from a need to assess and respond to the robust population of Hispanic Catholics in the United States. The LLTM is a joint project of Loyola Marymount University's Department of Theological Studies, and the Center for Religion and Spirituality. As a Catholic university in the largest Catholic uh, archdiocese in the country, whose parishes are decidedly brown and speak in many, many languages, LMU is uniquely situated to prepare Catholics who identify as Latinas and Latinos, and those who prioritize serving this community for leadership and service in the church. We gratefully acknowledge our co-sponsors tonight, the Office of the President, LMU Campus Ministry, the Center for Ignatian Spirituality, Center for Religion and Spirituality, CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice, Division of Student Affairs, Bellman College of Liberal Arts, the College of Communication and Fine Arts, Loyola Law School, Department of Theological Studies, the Office of Mission and Ministry, the Office for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, the T. Marie Chilton Chair in Catholic Theology, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, the Jesuit community at LMU, 
and the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, Western American province. Truly, it's taken a village to put tonight together. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you the Dean of the Bellman College of Liberal Arts, who will introduce you tonight's guest. Dr. Robin Crabtree is an accomplished teacher and scholar, respected for her strong commitment to Jesuit education and widely published in communication, gender studies, and community-based pedagogy. She's a champion of the inherent, enduring, and practical value of a liberal arts education. On a personal note, may I say that I've always felt that Robin has my back, as they say, and she fights the good fight. In the context of the academy, I think we all know what that means. To guard the ideals that brought us to the profession in the first place. Dr. Robin Crabtree. That is so kind, Ruben, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, everyone here, everyone there in the ether, wherever you are. Um, as Dean of the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, it's my distinct honor to welcome everyone here this evening, welcome those who join remotely, and also welcome those who are gonna watch the recording later because everyone streams, everyone time shifts. We know uh, this is our life now. On behalf of President Timothy Law Snyder, Provost Thomas Poon, and all of the academic deans, I want to express our collective appreciation for the annual Hispanic Ministry and Theology Lecture as one expression of our Catholic Jesuit Marymount mission, and to communicate our collective delight that LMU is the convener of conversations like this evening's. On behalf of the university leadership, I also want to welcome Dr. Austin Ivory. Uh, with gratitude for your acceptance of our invitation to speak this evening, your work is an inspiration to, uh, to us here, and you are a valued interlocutor and collaborator with many of our colleagues, some who are here, uh, spotted around the room, and others who uh, are probably watching. Uh, on behalf of all of us in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, I also want to recognize and thank our moderator tonight, Professor Ruben Martinez, LMU's Fletcher Jones Chair of Writing and Literature, and whose commitment to creative work, research, journalism, and activism, I can add music, I can add uh, to our students, um, really reflect the intersections of faith and justice so well. Um, I also wanna add my thanks to the coordinating committee for tonight's program and especially highlight Father Alan Deck SJ, Professor Cecilia Gonzalez Andreu, I saw you, I know you're here, here you are. Um, Nancy Pineda Madrid, Brett Hoover, and of course, Bob Herto. Um, the, Collabor the list of collaborators was really quite breathtaking, and it's one of the things that I think makes us um, happy and proud here at LMU to see that spirit of interdisciplinary and cross-unit collaboration. That, that was lovely. Um, Dr. Ivory will speak on this topic, Strangers as Siblings, Pope Francis on Migration. And obviously this topic is timely. And really, if we're paying attention at all, it's perennially urgent. I can't help but think about this subject related to LMU's mission commitments, internationalization. We recognize global interconnectedness, that global migration is a sociological reality, an historical reality of immense scale, complexity, and impact. It is also, you know, I think like a social scientist, but then I think like a humanist, it's a lived experience of a large segment of humanity that unfolds in quotidian lives and personal narratives, including those of many LMU students, faculty, staff, and our families. The positive impact of immigrants and migrants along with associated challenges and policies, often policy failures, are a priority issue here in Los Angeles, one of the most diverse places on the planet, and where so many of our fellow Angelinos were born elsewhere and who make up the very tapestry of what we mean by the moniker Angelino. 
Migration has been a significant apostolic priority for the Society of Jesus, which operates among other missions and, uh, and apostolic works that Jesuit refugee services around the world, including in the US. Uh, locally, the Jesuit West province is committed to the Kino Border Initiative, uh, with which so many of our faculty, uh, students, and staff have engaged over many decades. In fact, I was uh, having we having lunch a week and a half ago with an alum from the 1970s uh, who is still closely associated with the Kino Border Initiative, uh, which was one of her formative experiences. Uh, when she was here at LMU. And it remains a lifelong philanthropic and faith commitment for her. Uh, she, in fact, went on and on about it uh, when, I, when I met with her. Uh, of course, as we'll hear more about this evening, Pope Francis has spoken over and over again of migrants, about their rights, about human dignity, illuminating uh, their plight and, and these instantiations of plight that have come when, since he's been Pope, uh, welcoming them as brothers and sisters and calling on our collective hospitality, collective compassion, and of course, always our solidarity. I loved that my computer, when I was writing solidarity, gave me a spell check and wanted me to capitalize solidarity. And it was one of those moments of presence. You're doing something, you're, you're rushing, you're fitting in, and then there's this moment of, of real um, taking note, attention, attention, reverence, and devotion. I am proud that here in the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, we have dozens of faculty and many dozens of courses that take up these issues, these issues of migration and immigration, these migrant stories, these lives, with great disciplinary seriousness, also through interdisciplinary inquiry and engaged teaching and learning in our surrounding community and beyond, always with a commitment to a faith that does justice here in the Southland and around the world. So enough about us. Uh, let me now turn to introducing our distinguished speaker. Dr. Austin Ivory is a writer, a commentator, a speaker on contemporary church affairs, with a special interest in the Church of Latin America, of Latin America and the Papacy of Francis, uh, perfect for this event. He drew on his Doctor of Philosophy from St. Anthony's College, Oxford in 1993, which was published as Catholicism and Politics in Argentina, 1810 to 1960 for his biography of Pope Francis, the great reformer, Francis and the Making of a Radical Pope, which now has been translated into many languages. This is a story people want to know. He has recently published a follow-up, Reviewing the Pontificate, published in the United States as Wounded Shepherd, Pope Francis and the Struggle to Convert the Catholic Church, and that's now available in the UK as well. As a journalist and commentator, he has written widely on church affairs and on the Francis papacy, more specifically for publications such as The Tablet, Commonweal, The New York Times, Crux, Our Own, America Magazine, Thinking Faith, and many others. And he appears often on the BBC and other important media outlets. Dr. Ivory, you are in good company here at LMU, where I hope you are finding you have many old, as well as new friends, allies, thought partners, and compadres, comrades. Everyone, welcome again, and please join me in offering a warm lion welcome to Dr. Austin Ivory. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you so much, Ruben. So many other people to thank, but I think we've done enough thanking. So, hello, good evening. Y un gran saludo a los que nos siguen en línea. Hello to those joining us online. If you don't mind, I want to begin <clears throat> with uh, a 
little moment of prayer. And the reason for this is that Pope Francis arrived today in the Congo and he overflew, the plane overflew the Sahara Desert. And he came out and spoke to the journalists. And this is what he said. I'm going to read it in English and then in Spanish. Okay, and then we'll just take a moment. We're crossing the Sahara. Let's offer a prayer for all the people who, in search of some well-being, some freedom, have tried to cross it and didn't make it. So many suffering people who arrive in the Mediterranean after crossing the desert and who are taken into refugee camps and who suffer there. Let's pray for all these people. Estamos atravesando la Sahara. Recemos por aquellos que buscando un poco de bienestar, un poco de libertad, atraviesan el desierto pero nunca llegan. Y por los tantos que sufren que al llegar al Mediterráneo se los encierran en los campos de refugiados y allí sufren. Recemos por todos ellos. My friends, my topic tonight is Francis's contribution to church teaching on migration, not a small topic. And while he has made many, many different contributions, and I hope to talk about many of them tonight, I believe the key one is to invite us to see migration as a hermeneutic question. That is to say, the same question that lies at the heart of the gospel itself. The hermeneutic of mercy, the lens of mercy, rather than the lens of sacrifice. From France, Francis's first famous great blast from the island of Lampedusa in July 2013, over the past 10 years, he has constantly returned to this same challenge. Faced with the stranger, who do we see? What do we see? because there is no such thing as an unmediated encounter with reality. We're always looking through lenses. And the invitation of the gospel is to look at reality with the eyes of the disciple, of the loving father of the good shepherd, to see the need, the pain, the situation that cries out for a savior. That's the hermeneutic of mercy. That's God's hermeneutic. That's how God sees the world. The hermeneutic of sacrifice, on the other hand, is an instrumental form of looking in which we narrow reality to the frame of our own anxieties and ambitions. We don't let reality be. We don't let reality speak to us. We screen out what we don't want to see, the people in need, the situations that cry out for liberation. So in the sinful hermeneutic of sacrifice, either we exclude those situations and those people, or we see them as a threat, a rival, something to be expelled, suppressed, pushed aside, cast out. That's why papal teaching since the early 20th century has consistently seen the flight into Egypt as being about immigration, obviously, but more deeply about salvation. What remains the Magna Carta of papal teaching on the topic, that's post, uh, Pope Pius II, uh, the, the 12th post-war apostolic constitution of 1952, is called Exul Familia Nazarethana, after its open, opening line. The emigre holy family of Nazareth fleeing into Egypt is the archetype of every refugee family. And the reverse is also true. Every refugee family is the archetype of the holy family. They too flee precarity and existential danger. They too are poor and vulnerable, conditioned by threats and the co coercive pressures of the powerful. And they too are guided by angels, if not in dreams as in the Bible, then in the form of strangers who appear as if from nowhere to help and encourage them. So migration is a theological locus. It is the place of suffering and hope, the place that God knocks at the door, wait, wanting to enter. It's the place where, in the history of salvation, God already has entered, hidden as a foreigner. In the Gospel of Luke, of course, Christ is born to a refugee couple, displaced by a census, used by an occupying power, 
to tax the poor to pay for military occupation and Rome's proxy rulers. In the Gospel of Matthew, it is one of those proxy rulers, Herod, uh, who fears the birth of the child. But in both cases, the story of salvation takes place against the backdrop of a migrant story of non-recognition and rejection. One that sums up the basic experience of the Jewish people, the chosen people who are deported, enslaved, and under God's guidance, migrate to a new future. Now, John's Gospel, as we know, has no infancy narrative, but the same drama is expressed in theological terms. He was in the world, but the world knew him not. He came into his own domain, and his own people did not accept him. But then John adds the good news. But to all who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. So we have, alongside non-recognition and rejection, which keep us stuck in sin and division, <clears throat> we have recognition and hospitality, which create a new future. Now, Jesus famously dramatizes this choice in Matthew chapter 25. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was a stranger and you never made me welcome. And Jesus himself tells how those who are being judged are amazed at this. But when did we see you a stranger, they ask. And the answer is, of course, that none of them had seen God because the divinity of the stranger was hidden. But all of them had seen a stranger and all faced the same hermeneutic question, the one faced uh, in the parable of the Good Samaritan by the Levite, the priest and the Samaritan. When they saw, did they look away? When they looked, what did they see? Did they see a person of value, of dignity, uh, a person in need to whom they respond with hospitality? Or do they see someone of no account who doesn't deserve their attention or who was even a threat to their comfort and their interests? In other words, did they see through God's eyes with the hermeneutic of mercy or with the hermeneutic of sacrifice in which the needy is screened out, ignored, cast aside? for the sake of our comfort or our anxieties. So it's in a way a very straightforward idea I wanna to suggest to you tonight that Francis's teaching on migration, and I've read quite a lot of it, has revolved constantly around this choice, this challenge, the hermeneutic of sacrifice versus the hermeneutic of mercy, the drama of non-recognition and rejection versus recognition and hospitality, the throwaway culture uh, versus the culture of encounter. It's the contrast in the Bible between the indifference of Cain towards his brother Abel, am I my brother's keeper? And the response of Yahweh to Moses in the third chapter of Exodus, I have observed the misery of my people, I have heard their cry, and I have come down to deliver them. So by his relentless constant focus on migration, and by constantly highlighting the hermeneutical challenge involved, Francis is teaching us constantly the meaning of the words that Jesus urges the Pharisees to ponder. Go away, he says, and ponder the meaning of the words. What I want is mercy, not sacrifice. As Francis puts it in his 2022 message on migration, we come to see God's plan for humanity in the suffering, but also in the promise of migration. The truth that the kingdom of God must be built with migrants and refugees and victims of trafficking for without them, it would not be the kingdom that God wants. So thank you for your welcome to this stranger. I feel very much uh, at home. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the chance to explore with you tonight this, this key point. And the point is, just to kind of stress it again, that we don't get the fact that migration is so important for Francis if we think of him merely as having concern for a pressing social issue. You often see this in, in the reports on Francis on migration, that, that the Pope has put migration at the center of his concern because he really cares about it as an issue. Or the other thing that <clears throat> some of my journalistic colleagues often say is that Francis cares deeply about migration because it's personal for him, because he is of course the child of a migrant family. And both of those are true, <clears throat> but that isn't, I wanna suggest the key reason. But of course, migration is the most uh, is the, one of the great social challenges of our time, along with climate change. And Francis has put those two key concerns of our time right at the center of his pontificate. Uh, and but unlike the environmental question, 
um, which at least is the focus of international cooperation. We have the annual conference of parties meetings, don't we, organized by the UN. No such coordination yet exists at a, an international level to meet the plight and challenge of migration. In fact, we've gone backwards in that respect. So we're talking here of the largest existential periphery of our day, the greatest number of displaced people in human history, and certainly since the Second World War. If the number of people displaced from their homes were a country, it would be the fifth biggest in the world after China, India, the US, and Indonesia. But startlingly, 84% of all migrants are hosted by poor countries, by the developing world. Migration, or rather the response of the rich world to it, is perhaps then the greatest cause of division in our time. It is the great wall that has been erected in our world at this time. So that what the, the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall, I, I saw, by the way, that you have a bit of the Berlin Wall here on campus, amazing. Um, <clears throat> but what the Berlin Wall was to the pontificate uh, of John Paul II, we can argue that the Florida Strait, the desert of Arizona, the Mediterranean are to the era of Francis. All of this would be reason enough why Francis would want to create, as he did, a dedicated migrant section in the Vatican within the Dicastery for Human Development, the only section in Rome which is under his personal direction. So there is no head of that section. He is the head of that section. But what gets missed in addition to these two reasons, yeah, it's a major social issue and it's personal for him, is this evangelical dimension, this gospel dimension with which I began. Because for Francis, how we respond to this challenge is the locus of our conversion and salvation right now as humanity. In other words, it is the place or, of our conversion or the place where we resist that conversion. Uh, it is a sign of the times where civility itself is in play, as he put it in Malta last year. And he added in that speech that for Christians too, in play is our fidelity to the gospel of Jesus, who said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. So Francis perceives here a spiritual contest in play at the moment in the world, the result of which will be decisive for our future. Interestingly, he hasn't so far written an encyclical on migration as he has, of course, for the environmental question. But if you look at his teaching documents, you'll find that the theme of migration runs all the way through them. For example, Evangelii Gaudium, he talks about the credibility of the church's witness at this time. Migrants uh, present a particular challenge since I am the pastor of a church without borders, a church which considers herself mother to all. Even in his 2018 document on holiness, Gaudete et exultate, rejoice and be glad, he's astonished that any Christian could consider migration as somehow a secondary issue. It frankly amazes him. Because for a Christian, the only proper attitude is to stand, this is a quote, is to stand in the shoes of those brothers and sisters of ours who risk their lives to offer a future to their children. This is what Jesus asks of us when he tells us that in welcoming the stranger, we welcome him. As his pontificate has gone on, he's developed two key insights in my view. First, in our capacity for seeing or not the needs of the stranger lies the test of the possibility of our building a collective subject, a we, a people, that is capable of confronting the challenges we face at this time whether we can build a people capable of acting more and more as a single family dwelling in a common home, as he puts it in Fratelli Tutti. It's actually better in Spanish. Construirnos en un nosotros que habita la casa común. Whether we can build a we. Secondly, in the process of constructing that collective subject, that we, on which depends our capacity to welcome the stranger, lies our salvation as a fraternal world a world, in other words, capable of living uh, a peaceful coexistence, and on our fidelity as a church to Christ. So this is not a small matter. In this way, as Francis puts it in his first message for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, migrants and refugees are an occasion that providence gives us to help build a more just society, a more perfect democracy, a more united country, 
a more fraternal world and a more open and evangelical Christian community. Now, the reason I've called tonight's talk Strangers into Siblings, which, uh, uh, which borrows, of course, from a translation of, of Fratelli Tutti, Hermanos y Hermanos, no? Hermanos y Hermanas Todos, but also the, the terrific US and Mexican bishops document of 2003, Strangers No Longer. But I was also thinking actually of a campaign that I used to run for a time in London, uh, which was called Strangers Into Citizens, which was inspired by regularization campaigns led by the US bishops here. Um, uh, because, um, because we're a monarchy, somebody joked that really it should be called Strangers Into Subjects. Uh, but that didn't have quite the same emancipatory feel. <laughs> but uh, we were inspired, uh, I was inspired in this campaign and the Cardinal Archbishop in Westminster of London at the time, uh, by the example of the US church, with this idea that with roots come rights, very, very important contribution, I think, that the US church made to that whole question. And it's what brought me uh, into this question emotionally uh, and spiritually. Uh, but it's really now with the Francis Pontificate that I've been able, I think, to grasp it at a much deeper level. So a quick overview of Catholic social teaching and then on this, and then we'll dig into where I think Francis's great contribution lies. So Catholic social teaching, CST, has had really three phases. The first arises out of the great wave of migration to the Americas in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, of which, of course, the Pope himself, his family, is, is a result, his family emigrated from Piedmont in Italy in the late 1920s. Uh, that's to say his grandmother, his grandparents and his, and his father. Um, and of course that great wave of migration uh, demanded of the church a pastoral strategy and a vision. So that was the first phase. The second phase in the 1950s was of course the result of World War II and the major displacement of peoples. And that's what forms the backdrop to the 1952 uh, papal teaching uh, exul familia. And then we get a third major development under John Paul II, right at the end of his pontificate, 2003, with the document Ergo Migrantis Caritas Christi, which comes out against the backdrop of a new global order, a globalized, one might say, order in which capital and goods are now flowing freely around the world, but not, of course, people. Uh, and that creates so many of the endless uh, uh, conundrum that we deal with. Uh, and in which migration is also increasingly, as you know, here in the United States, a South-North phenomenon. And so with Francis, I think what we have is the fourth, and I would argue, most extensive development in Catholic social teaching on migration yet. And as it were, uh, it is interesting to try and think about what that contribution is and how it will look in the future. When future lecturers in 10 years time with the same lecture uh, who will, how people will look back and see Francis's contribution. Anna Rowland, who I think has written one of the best books on Catholic social teaching just recently out, um, says that Francis has taken what was under John Paul and Benedict, an emphasis fundamentally on global political actors, uh, and refocused the church's concern on the local and the concrete as the context in which the global is lived out. So that the attention that Francis has brought has been on the suffering and the tragedy of the liminal spaces in between nation states, places where migrants die, as Francis was remembering on the plane uh, today, uh, but all, all who die in other ways, you know, psychologically uh, living, uh, being treated terribly in refugee camps or left in those refugee camps for years and years and years on end, not knowing what will happen to them. The ongoing absence of a refugee sharing mechanism among states is leading, in fact, to ever harsher treatment of migrants at borders, as you know very well from the example here. UN conventions are increasingly being defined. Man migrants are increasingly left to languish uh, in seas and on islands and in deserts, as well as places of encampment and transit refugee camps and detention centers. So it's from those spaces, the liminal spaces between states, that <clears throat> Francis has focused his voice. So from Lampedusa, Malta, Lesbos, but also Ciudad Juarez or Dhaka in Bangladesh, where 600,000 Rohingya refugees have sought safety. Francis has gone to all these places and from them issued uh, a kind of encyclical of gestures 
including many of the most striking and newsmaking of his pontificate. Famously, of course, he returned from Lesbos twice with a plane with migrants actually on the plane or who arrived uh, afterwards. Um, and uh, uh, um, some some of these gestures, and he's described these as the power of gestures rather than the rather than gestures of power. Now, some of these visits, some of these gestures, which have really made the news, are designed, are thought of by him in part to scandalize and to challenge the wall building drive of populist nationalism. But many others have happened spontaneously. They've happened simply because he was there as when famously in November 2017, he cried with the Rohingya people uh, in, it, he was just with them in this refugee camp and he was listening to them. And he said these extraordinary words and it was just in his heart. He said, the presence of God today is called Rohingya. But all of these gestures, whether spontaneous or planned are fruit of a deeper discernment about this moment in human history. And that by understanding and responding to the way migrants are treated now tells us something vital about the state of our society, but also the path of our salvation and our redemption. So this salvation begins with facing the truth about who we are and what we have become as humanity. And if you like, allowing our hearts to break with that knowledge. More than 2 million people have tried to cross the Mediterranean to Europe since 2014, mostly from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. 25,000 have died uh, in the process, victims of the, of, of the irresponsibility of human traffickers, but also of decisions taken or not by border authorities of countries intent on deterring such journeys. In February 2015, two years after the iconic trip to Lampedusa in the Mediterranean, another migrant boat sank between Libya and Lampedusa, carrying a thousand people, whom the traffickers had charged something like $1,500 each. Italy raised the boat from, the, from, from, from where it had sunk, towed it to land, and performed autopsies on the corpses. There were layers and layers of bodies crammed together onto the boats, just like the slave ships of the 19th century. But unlike slavery then, which was clearly the responsibility of the, the, the traffickers of the slave trade, here in this case, there was nobody to blame. The buck was passed. There's a dramatic illustration of Francis's words at Lampedusa about the globalization of indifference. Who is responsible for, these, for the blood of these brothers and sisters of ours? Nobody, he said, that is our answer. It isn't me. I don't have anything to do with it. It must be somebody else, but it's certainly not me. Yet, Francis said, God is asking each one of us, where is the blood of your brother which cries out to me? Now, Francis began that homily actually even earlier in the Genesis story with God calling out to Adam, where are you? Francis notes how Adam had lost his bearings, his place in creation, because he thought he could be powerful, he could control everything. And in this mentality, which we can see now so much in this kind of technocratic paradigm of our world, um, that this mentality, which has created this kind of culture of comfort, the other ceases to be a brother or sister, but in fact becomes one who threatens to disturb my comfort, my prosperity, and my well-being. So since Lampedusa, Francis has used these tragedies to tell a story of human disorientation. We are, as a humanity, disoriented. A loss of direction comparable to slavery, to the Holocaust, or some of the other great events of history, which so shame us. And he uses terms like bankruptcy of humanity, disgrace. He said in Cyprus, we read stories of concentration camps of the last century. And we say, how could this possibly have happened? Brothers and sisters, it is happening now, today, on nearby coasts. Lesbos and Malta, he spoke of the stranding and capsizing of boats of refugees as a shipwreck of civilization. So he names the truth, that's where he's starting. We name the truth about what we've become, but he doesn't stop there because he grasps that in every situation of apparent despair and sin, God is always present. This is something I've learned from Francis that he does. He starts by looking at the situation and then he asks, where is where in this situation are we being invited to go? Because in every crisis, there's always a grace of conversion on offer. 
even in situations as apparently hopeless as the migration one now. In Let Us Dream, which is the book uh, I did with Pope Francis in 2020, he quotes the poet Holderlin, where the danger is, there grows the saving power. So what Francis wants us to see is that God is already at work, even in this situation, through his mercy. Indeed, God's action is his mercy, which is transformative insofar as we have the capacity to receive it. And the way God's mercy works is never to impose a path of conversion, but rather to constantly offer it. So Francis's role in the migration crisis is to act, as I've often described him, as humanity's spiritual director, almost like leading us on a retreat, alerting us to, first of all, getting us to face the truth, secondly, to see where the grace is on offer, and then to help us see where the temptations and the obstacles are that prevent us receiving that grace of conversion. Francis explained this, I thought, really brilliantly in his homily at Ciudad Juarez, or El Paso, in February 2016. I was there. Uh, using the book of Jonah, he likened the state of our world to the city of Nineveh in the book of Jonah, where selfishness, violence, and injustice are creating death and destruction. Now, Nineveh is destroying itself, and the response of God is to send Jonah, the reluctant prophet, to wake up a people intoxicated with themselves, as Francis puts it, to help them see and weep over what they've become. Far from bringing destruction, says Francis, as we so often desire or want to bring about, mercy seeks to transform each situation from within. So this is all the homily in Ciudad Juarez. After highlighting the suffering at the border, which he describes in, in some detail, Francis then returns to the crisis in the world that has created or allowed the suffering, and then, like Jonah, invites us to weep and to ask for the gift of conversion saying there's always time to change, always a way out, always an opportunity, always the time to implore the mercy of God. So in these steps, I want to suggest Francis isn't just responding to migration, but to contemporary modernity. Put another way, how the church engages with the challenge of migration is a key test of its capacity for evangelization, evangelization in our time. So to illustrate this, I'd like to just go to a talk which the then Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires gave in uh, shortly after being made a Cardinal in 2001. He was addressing a group of educators as he did every year. And the talk was about contemporary modernity. It was a kind of analysis of society. And it was on the theme of rootlessness, of the breakup of society, non-belonging, what we might call liquid modernity. So a favorite theme of his and a big theme of his own discernment. But what was striking about this talk was how he began with an exercise of contemplative imagination. Imaginative contemplation, I should say. They were asked to picture, he asked them to picture a person who would be arriving from the interior of Argentina, which would be a very remote rural areas, arriving in the big city in search of a future. He invited them to contemplate how that person might feel, their loneliness, their fear, the fact they don't know anyone, they don't know who to ask. They have a long, cold night ahead of them. And Begoglia says they would surely just have really one question. There would really be one question on their minds. And it's the question, isn't it, that every migrant has in his or her heart. Will there be a hospitable soul to open a door for me, to offer me something hot and to allow me to rest, to sustain me and give me strength to decide the next steps? Now, what I find interesting about this is that Bergoglio was not giving a talk about migration. He was giving a talk about contemporary modernity. So he was beginning with an exercise in, in, of contemplation of a migrant arriving in a big city. And then he explained why he was beginning in that way. He said this, we could have started this reflection by citing authors and documents and theories about the situations of contemporary man, his depersonalization but I preferred you to invite you to see it from the perspective of feeling from the heart, because this ministry of warm welcome, of healing the human person through hospitable love, is firstly a response to an experience, not an idea. It's the human ethical experience of perceiving the pain and the need of the brother, and in it, the experience of recognizing the Lord who is passing through. 
in the pilgrim who is in the open air when evening falls and the day is over. And to know that by opening our heart, we will be allowing him to make his dwelling among us in order to discover at that moment full of joy that the roles are reversed and that dwelling among us, that heart of a father, brother and mother is open to receive us and we have finally come home. So for the Cardinal faced with an uprooted humanity, anguished by fragmentation, the loss of belonging, the Lord is calling on the church to evangelize in a particular way, to be a certain way in this context. And he said it very well in Paraguay in 2015, when he said the church is called to evangelize, not with arguments, strategies, and tactics, but learning to welcome, to offer hospitality. In other words, the suffering that humanity is undergoing at the moment is analogous in many ways to what migrants undergo. It's the pain of non-belonging. And the key thing is this, that the experience is one of pain. It's a, it's a heart. It's an experience, an experience of anguish. So that if the church wishes to respond with the hermeneutic of mercy to this experience, it is not enough to offer a series of doctrines, of abstract intellectual propositions. And that's why a big theme of the Francis Pontificate from a Parasida to Evangelii Gaudium is, to quote a favorite line of Benedict's, Christianity is not the result of a proposition, uh, an intellectual idea, but the encounter with a person who changes your horizon and gives life a decisive direction. In other words, Christianity is firstly an experience. It's an event. It's an encounter with Christ, which is always an encounter, of course, with mercy. And where nowadays is that encounter possible? How does the church facilitate that encounter? And for Francis, the answer is staring at the church from Scripture itself. In opening our heart to the one who is uprooted, we meet Christ who is passing by. And from that encuentro fundante, that founding encounter, as a parasita calls it, flows everything else, our belonging to God, our belonging to creation, and our belonging to each other. And it's no accident, by the way, that the three great teaching documents of this pontificate are about those three kinds of belonging. Evangelii Gaudium is about our belonging to God, Laudato Si, our belonging to creation, and Fratelli Tutti about our belonging to each other. So this is really the heart of the reform of the pontificate. It sounds simple, but it's the fruit of a very profound discernment. And it allows us to understand why, for Francis, the response to migration is at the heart of the conversion, pastoral, missionary, and synodal, to which he's calling the church. Now, to understand this, we need to just go for a moment to Fratelli Tutti, which explicitly connects the response to the stranger with the building of a fraternal society. So in Lampedusa, Francis has already compared the world's refusal to take responsibility for the suffering of migration with the hypocrisy of the priest and the Levite uh, in, the, in the Good Samaritan parable. So the hypocrisy there is to express sympathy, but not to act in not allowing themselves to be changed, not responding concretely. So in chapters two and three of Fratelli Tutti, Francis goes into this in great depth by giving a kind of guided contemplation on the Good Samaritan parable, which plays precisely with the hermeneutic of mercy and sacrifice. He says the gospel presents the basic decision we need to make to rebuild our wounded world, the decision to include or exclude those lying wounded by the roadside, a choice that put, puts into second place distinctions of function of category, priest, merchants, and so on. All that disappears uh, because ultimately there are really only two kinds of people, those who care for the one who is hurting and those who pass by on the other side. So remember where we began, God comes into the world and experiences non-recognition and rejection. And when that happens, nothing happens because non-recognition and rejection is incapable of creating a new future. God cannot enter our story, God never imposes. But some do recognize and welcome the stranger. And so God can come into the story. And in this way, history can be changed. The Samaritan's response precipitates a conversion captured in the titles of Fratelli Tutti, envisaging and engendering an open world, a heart open to the whole world, and so on. So we have a conversion 
from a fearful, isolated, clinging to identity and tribe to another kind of humanity, an authentic universal fraternity in which compassion for all living beings, the foreigner, the stranger, the marginalized, the outsider, becomes the foundation of a new kind of society. So the joyful journey, the joyful news, is that the journey from strangers to siblings, the journey that begins with the welcome of migrants, is not just the journey of those who migrate, but also of those who welcome them, which is the point Begoglio was making in his, in his address in Buenos Aires. How does this happen? Well, at the heart of this transformation is the capacity for self-transcendence, which is ultimately the measure of obedience to God's will. By, by that I mean what in chapter three of Fratelli Tutti, Francis calls ecstasis, the going out. Human beings are made for love, for going out to find a fuller existence in the other. And the relationships that really enable this, the relationships that really allow us to grow in this way, are not the relationships with the, of the groups I'm born into. It's not my family, my workplace, my town, if you like, but those who are beyond my natural circle. Every brother or sister in need, when, when abandoned or ignored by the society in which I live, becomes an existential foreigner, even if born in the same country. That's from 97. In other words, the litmus test of our obedience to God's will is the way we are, uh, our capacity to reach out to and engage with and respond to foreigners, outsiders, those who are outside or treated as outside, as outcasts. And of course, in the case of migrants, it's usually both at the same time because the migrant is both an outcast and a foreigner. Now, chapter three of Fratelli Tutti refers to a very uh, interesting essay by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. And this essay is called Le Socius et le Prochain, The Neighbor and the Associate, is how it's translated. The two categories, neighbor and associate, mark the difference between those capable of self transcendence and those who are not. So, reflecting on the Good Samaritan, Ricoeur says that Jesus' answer to the question, who is my neighbor, is that the neighbor is not a social object, but a behavior in the first person. I don't have a neighbor. I make myself somebody's neighbor. And this is what in Fratelli Tutti is called a consciously cultivated fraternity. It's a choice. It's an exercise of freedom, one that moves us out beyond our social role, our identity, uh, and allows us to make ourselves a neighbor to become a prochain. Now, when you read these two categories, they're not kind of exclusive because obviously, you know, relationships of kinship, mutual self-interest, contract relationships are all obviously important. We can't have institutions. Our society doesn't function without them. You know, we need these kinds of relationships if we're to get anything done. The church itself is an institution of, in many ways, those kinds of relationships. Um, but the point is that the, the problem is when these partnerships or institutions close in on themselves and become refuges to retreat to, in other words, walls we move in behind, identities we cling to. In Letters Dream, Francis says this, when the Levite and the priest withdraw from the man left bleeding and beaten by the thieves, they're trying to preserve their own place, their roles, their status quo, faced with a crisis that tests them. So what they see and, what, and how they respond is driven ultimately by their own fears, uh, their fears of being displaced. So stopping to assist the Samaritan, you know, in the case of the Levites and the priest brings all kinds of complications. He's bleeding. So we have the whole impurity thing. But there are always reasons not to stop and to help another because it always is a challenge. Uh, but the Samaritan, who's a kind of a nobody, he's not clinging to any role. He has this capacity for self-transcendence. He doesn't cling to what he fears to lose. So he's capable of moving out and responding to the pain. And that's why, of course, so often, as we know from anybody who is involved in any kind of work with the poor, that those who are poor and excluded are usually much better able to respond to the needs of the poor and excluded than those who are clinging to status. And this is the role, of course, that my, Francis tells migrants that they, in a way, need to perform in the contemporary role to be witnesses of those human values essential for a dignified and fraternal life. 
So the point is this, when the hermeneutic of sacrifice dominates institutions or associations, they become highly defensive. They become geared to exclusion, closed self-referential structures. And he explores this in Fratelli Tutti, saying that those capable only of being associates create closed worlds. So what Francis is describing is very familiar to us, right? And we're talking here about a world in many ways, a radically individualistic world in which social bonds have become a tool for advancing individual interests, in which interpersonal relationships are emptied of love, in which when they become cold, contractual, determined by the logic of the market. So here we have a spiritual diagnosis of the rise of a certain kind of politics, populist, nationalist politics, identity wars, post-truth communication, polarization and so much else that marks our time. But it's also, of course, a diagnosis of what has happened to the church increasingly marked by internal division. When Francis spoke of the church as self-referential in his pre-conclave address in 2013, it was also a diagnosis of the church's own capacity, loss of the church's capacity to evangelize, the way it had closed in on itself and almost withdrawn from the people into a kind of defensive moralism. The best diagnosis of this mentality is in Let Us Dream when Francis talks about the isolated conscious. And we've had plenty of examples in recent weeks of this following in Rome with the critiques of, of, of the papacy. And what's so interesting is that the criticism of Francis, particularly of his leadership right now, the major criticism is of what? It's of the synod. It's of people gathering together encountering each other and opening themselves to each other. That's the very thing that some people most fear. Because of course, through the synod, strangers who might be lifelong Catholics are discovering that they are siblings. They belong to each other. They belong to the people of God. So a church that has lost the capacity to enlarge its tent in this way, to use the Isaiah image of the continental stage document, is definitely, by definition, a church that no longer evangelizes, because, of course, evangelization is the mediation of God's hospitality to the stranger. So the Recur essay goes on to talk about how it's actually easier to see ourselves as sons and daughters of God, as siblings, when we're struck by disaster, by crisis, when failures of the social realm, as he calls it, because in wars or in the pandemic that we've just been through, we become, as Ricoeur puts it, socially stripped, and we're able to perceive the depth of human relationships. And in the years, it's very interesting, in the years leading up to the pandemic, Francis's view was essentially the diagnosis of a parasida about the breakups of society and fragmentation. And he, of course, spoke a lot about how the anguish was being exploited by wall-building politics, by uh, by national populism and so on. In Chile, he warned that life would become increasingly fragmented and conflictual and violent. All this very somber view you see in the first chapter of Fratelli Tutti. But when I asked him in the midst of the pandemic whether he still believed that, I was surprised to find that he was more hopeful. We're not there yet, he said. This crisis has called forth the sense that we need each other, that the people still exist. So I was quite struck by this, that his discernment of the pandemic was a kind of where he sees the hope is in this awakening through the shared experience of suffering to a new consciousness of being a people. So finally, I want to just show how that hope now plays out on the migration issue <clears throat> using this three part dynamic of letter stream of contemplate, discern and act. Are you all right? Do you want to stand up for a moment? Do you want to turn to your neighbor? Take, take a minute or two just to turn to your neighbor. And uh, <clears throat> I've been talking for a long time. No, I'm okay. Actually, it is a bit cold. Though. Is that? Is that <laughs> yes. I, I hear you're a bit cold. Feel free to jog. Right, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Okay, good. Let's I haven't got too much more. And I know you're a bit cold.
So just to end on this path of conversion to which I think Francis is calling us in the, in the, through the issue of migration. So beginning by contemplating the reality. So an honest looking, being unafraid to look reality in the eye, not turning away from the suffering and the complexity that the migration crisis uh, poses. Um, in Ciudad Juarez, when Francis is talking about God sending Jonah to awaken Nineveh, this is of course the first task of the church to tell the story of the crisis. This crisis, which can be measured in numbers and statistics, we want instead to measure with names, stories, and families, he said. Because only when we allow ourselves to be struck by what we see, we'll be, be able to enter into discernment, to be able to ask what's going on here? What does it mean? And what are we being called to through this crisis? And to ask, what have we become? And the second step is the discernment one. Francis' teaching on migration isn't afraid to hold in tension the various goods in play in this whole question. Local versus global, the right to migrate versus the right to regulate borders. These are all tensions, goods that have to be held in tension. So he asks us to hold them in tension against a horizon of fraternity and to enter into encounter and listening. This is essentially the chapter four of Fratelli Tutti. Discernment allows us to do two things. First of all, to unmask the mediocrity and media and manipulation of so much political discourse. And secondly, to propose the hermeneutic of mercy, showing how hospitality to the stranger is the key to building a society that nurtures its true roots and identity. So just very quickly, unmasking contemporary political discourse, false either or polarizations. We're very familiar with this in the migration debate, aren't we? The idea that communities are overwhelmed by migrants, that to protect a nation's identity, you have to exclude the foreigner. All those kinds of either or, uh, uh, which reflects the hermeneutic of sacrifice. In, in, in the Brexit debate, in 2016, we were told we had to choose between being British and European. Why? <laughs> Secondly, it exposes the false narratives of scarcity and rivalry that govern most anti-migrant discourse. The neo-Darwinian Malthusian assumption that, that, that basically life is a, a mad struggle and competition for scarce resources. We're all in competition with each other. Uh, which assume, of course, brutal processes in which the strong drive out the weak. And it's quite striking that this discourse most commonly is from the wealthiest places in the world. Thirdly, the false narratives of sacrifice. The idea, for example, that the personal safety and security of migrants fleeing persecution must be sacrificed to national security, that families can be separated in the interests of, I don't know, deterring migrants or something. Bishop Seitz of El Paso, the wonderful Bishop Mark Seitz, issued a very powerful letter in 2017 deploring a kind of Pharisaism that exists around all the laws around migration, which, as we know, can become, well, Pharisaical. So entering into discernment allows us to expose these and also to see that the narrow forms of nationalism reflect a spiritual desolation brought on by a focus on self and on material well-being. Francis invites us to move to a state of consolation in which we see mutual interdependence, reciprocity, and gift exchange in a world of plenty infused by grace. And this way we come to see, when we start to look at it through that lens, we start to see actually national security is bolstered, not undermined by safe and legal migrations. Our culture is enriched and strengthened by the integration of new elements, it's not undermined. This is not advancing a globalist agenda. One of the things that makes me laugh is when Trump or Salvini accuses Francis of being a globalist, because everything in Francis's own background in Argentina points actually the other way. He's very much from a national, popular nationalist uh, tradition, Peronist tradition, which is all about affirmation of place uh, and roots. He himself, by the way, famously never traveled as Archbishop of Buenos Aires. What in fact he's proposing though, is a plurality of culture and identities is the criterion for a fraternity that is neither abstract nor homogenous. 
in Kabida Amazonia, he talks about a healthy openness in which the native born nurture their roots and cultures through mestizaje rather than indigenismo. Mestizaje being the blending, of course, of, or adding of the new elements rather than indigenismo, which is an attempt to preserve a kind of purity. Uh, so this is, so for Francis, cultures are always of value, but they always need to be renewed through openness to the outside. Just as a healthy person grows through a faith that always moves us out beyond ourselves, towards God and to receive the new elements. So a healthy dynamic society is one which is rooted, but the roots are constantly nourished by the gifts that strangers bring. And this way, uh, Francis says in Cadena Amazonia, difference ceases to be either a badge or a frontier and can become a bridge. As Francis says in Fratelli Tutti, a healthy openness never threatens one's own identity and a living culture is one that both nourishes the original culture while offering new elements, fertile soil in which to take root. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll miss the next paragraph. And then just to move to act. So the four verbs that Francis uses to sum up the church's teaching on migration, welcoming, protecting, promoting, and integrating, the famous four words, they need to be conjugated. Verbs need to be conjugated. In other words, we need to do them. That means whatever enables these at every level, local, regional, national, church and society, humanitarian corridors, community sponsorship, advocacy. And it's all about putting your mouth where, putting your money where your mouth is. In 2015, he asked every parish and religious community in Europe to house at least one migrant family fleeing death by war and hunger. It's never been followed up. I would love to know how many took up that invitation. He's told religious communities facing decline to open their doors to migrants because empty convents don't belong to them. They are for the flesh of Christ, which is what refugees are. So around those four verbs, we have a series of concrete measures which add up to a, a, a Christian response to migration, which the Vatican's migrant section has set out in a whole series of actions, which individuals and communities are invited to take. These are actions that flow from the hermeneutic of mercy, which reject the hermeneutic of sacrifice. They're actions which show us how to build a future of fraternity rather than remain in a past of locked walls. As Francis said in his 2019 World Day, if we put these four verbs into practice, we will help build the city of God and of mankind. So to sum up, Francis has made a number of very important contributions to Catholic social teaching, and I don't pretend to have summed them all up here, but I think there's none greater than to show that at the heart of our response to migration, to the migration challenge, is the place where the gospel is both being opposed, but is also being born in our time. That in our response as individuals, as society, as church, we are either embracing the hermeneutic of mercy or a sinful hermeneutic of sacrifice. Only the first is capable of creating society, of creating fraternity. The second plunges us back into a dark future of closed worlds and growing violence. To receive the stranger is to open the way to God's action in the world. It is literally to bring about our salvation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ivory. Um, just as a reminder, now that uh, we are um, entering the question and answer section of our evening, uh, that we here in the auditorium, uh, in terms of uh, uh, translation, will now be, you can uh, access it by, by phone, right? Uh, and you have the phone, uh, the instructions for accessing the simultaneous translation on the back part of your program. Para los que están aquí presentes, en el auditorio, la traducción simultánea eh, se puede, eh, se, se hace a través del teléfono y en la parte posterior de sus programas están las instrucciones para acceder. Eh, ¿Qué más? 
las tarjetas. Uh, for the question and answer, those who are here in the auditorium, you have, you're given index cards and you can write down questions, which will be uh, passed on to us up here. Uh, las preguntas se pueden poner en las tarjetitas esas blancas que recibieron al entrar, por favor. Y, and for those of you online, uh, you have the uh, Q&A function of the Zoom webinar. Para los que están en línea, está la aplicación para hacer este, preguntas a través del webinar en Zoom, ¿no? I, I believe that's, and uh, yes, so we can start to have a little, I'll just ask a, a question or two briefly. Um, Dr. Ivory, the um, uh, magnificent, really, overview of this, and uh, it was to be reminded of something so obvious at the beginning of your talk. You know, we have a huge international structure for dealing with climate change, but we have no not that we've solved climate change, but we have no international structure uh, like that. Uh, if if we have anything at all, it's a binational dialogue, and and those uh, of course have have failed. So uh, to have nothing happening on the migration side of it, and at a moment when migration and climate change are intimately, increasingly interconnected, is is astonishing, really. Um, but we have here also someone who ha has had um, quite a bit of face time with Pope Francis. And you know, we're, we're in a Jesuit institution here, so it's less than six degrees of separation between us and, and, the, and the Vatican. Okay. We're a little bit closer, right, to the Vatican than uh, before. But you've really had some, I just have to ask. I mean, did you guys eat popcorn and watch the two popes together? And you know, I mean, uh, well, just a little bit. Yeah, 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 I, I, no, I, I get it, I get it. Um, that's okay. It's just, uh, the, the, uh, well, I didn't get, I didn't actually sit down with Pope Francis until June 2018, uh, so a long time after I wrote the biography. And that meeting came about because um, <laughs> it was a mutual friend said to me that uh, he had had a message from Pope Francis that when I was next in Rome, if I had the time, if I could do this. So of course, I was on the next plane. Um, <laughs> but but we, yeah, so we had, we had a, a, a lovely meeting and um, by that time, I'd written the biography and, of course, quite a few articles and so on. And I had heard from various Latin American bishops who had said to me, uh, el, el Papa quiere que leamos tu libro. The Pope wants us to read your book. Um, and so I realized that, that it, it was kind of being talked about. But no, he, um, so the first thing he said to me was, uh, I've read a number of things that you've written about me and I just have one criticism. <laughs> so I thought, oh no, what, you know, I thought of all the mistakes I'd made. And then he smiled and he said, I think you're too kind to me. <laughs> so I said, oh, I, I said, I promise to be tougher on you in future. But, but uh, so, th so that was the only meeting. And then what happened was uh, uh, my second book, Wounded Shepherd, came out. And then uh, that was at the end of 2019. And then it was in the pandemic when I just wrote to him very boldly and suggested this book called Let Us Dream. Uh, and he said, OK, let's do it, but I'll need some help from you. But in fact, we didn't meet because we were both in lockdown. So I sent him questions by, uh, uh, you know, emailed the questions and he recorded his answers onto his secretary's iPhone who sent them to me as audio files. Uh, um, but so, so I had a lot of contact with him at that time without actually sitting down with him. Um, but yeah, last year I had a number of meetings with him. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Sorry, that's not really, it's not really juicy, is it? But I, I, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I mean, I suppose I, I've sat down with him enough now and worked with him um, to become used to how he is. But I, but I do remember that first meeting in 2018 being really overwhelmed by his presence. And it, it, it's a phenomenal combination of great authority, but at the same time, this kind of lightness of touch and this peace. And you feel really, you feel joyful in his presence. And you feel you can say anything and, and ask him anything. You know, uh, It's extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, one more question, and then we can um, uh, start fielding questions from online and, and from here. Um, really, uh, I, I just am really struck by um, uh, your weaving together his thoughts on my uh, this, this massive subject that's which touches upon so many structures, social structures, uh, and our history, uh, human history. <sighs> In the talk 
in his in, in Pope Francis's his own version of the Samaritan talk that you cited in front of the educators in, in, in Buenos Aires. Um, it's, it's a beautiful uh, passage where he, he comes to the point where here is a migrant coming from the north of Argentina and he's appearing and how do we regard this person, right? How do we answer the call? And, uh, and there's this wonderful moment of reversal when it's not us that's our opening the door, it's the door, a door is opening for us and we are walking through that door. And the, what actually pushes the door open is, is difference. We are recognizing through somebody who's different from us, revealing us to ourselves. And there's something about this that just keeps on, that, that, that door is opening and closing in society. And, and it, it, it feels like right now we're at a crisis point where that door is slamming shut and we are not able to recognize ourselves in difference. Is there some, something else you could tell us from his teachings um, in, to reconcile the mystery really of how we deal with difference and how difference is a door to recognizing ourselves? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I, I think um, I mean, it is normal, isn't it, uh, in human history when societies um, feel under pressure, when there's a lot of stress and anxiety or anguish, um, the borders tend to close down. People become more afraid of the stranger. Uh, and I think it's too, I mean, when you know in your own life, when you're feeling stressed and beleaguered, you want to take control. You know, you, you, you become much less open. Um, so in a way, uh, 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 one of the great things that a sound spirituality, the church can do for society is to enable it to, to um, uh, I suppose, to deal with its anxieties and neuroses. And that's why ultimately it's the story, the salvation comes from faith in Christ. You know, as in the story of Peter stepping out of the boat, he, he starts to look at the waves, <laughs> He's, he sinks. But Jesus says, keep your eye on me, you know. Um, and I think that's 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 the point. So the challenge of difference, difference is a challenge. And um, the question is what we what happens to that difference, whether whether we become stressed by it and start to withdraw or whether we see it as the invitation to growth. Uh, and and that, that's yeah, that's the challenge. So a, a, a healthy spirituality in in the church, the church could, should be able to do this you know, for society. But then you look at the church sometimes and you think, well, actually, how many people in the church are themselves capable of this? Which is why I think his message is firstly directed at the church itself. It, 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 I'm just struck by how far political discourse is, uh, even on the liberal side, Absolutely. the progressive Absolutely. side, uh, from this type of, of teaching, right. really. Uh, and that, by the way, the, is the explanation as to why. See, you said we don't yet have a solution to climate change. We don't, but we have a commitment by the world's to, to, to having one. In other words, the world has agreed that we need an agreed common solution to climate change, which is why we have the COP meetings. But the world has not yet agreed th to have a common strategy on dealing with migration. Why? Because the pot, the, it's too hot a topic in, in each country. In other words, the politics, national politics, are so bound up with, uh, with immigration. Uh, I mean, it's common, it's commonly said by liberal politicians, it's the one issue that they know that they can lose an election on. You know, and and uh, that's why it's it's so poisonous and so pernicious. Just imagine a, a candidate saying, "We are through opening our borders. We are actually going to re recognize ourselves." It just it just doesn't. Well, no, and yet I've always thought that actually a a, a politician who names the truth, uh, which is that actually countries that are capable of, of receiving uh, migrants and integrating them are healthier, more prosperous, more dynamic. I mean, the history of the United States surely, uh, you know, demonstrates that in itself. I mean, we, we, we live through Brexit in the UK, where, where there was this bizarre idea of taking back control, you know, and actually what we've ended up with was an immigration policy, which now much more favors people traffickers. We have far more illegal immigration now than we had before Brexit. 
because in fact it was a neurotic policy it wasn't real it was all it was people's fears being encouraged by politicians so i've always thought actually a politician who's ca who's capable of saying you know what we need 200,000 people to come in a year if our if we want to have growth we need immigration you can you can find you can have a stagnant economy but because i mean in northern europe we just don't have the births at the moment to, to meet with it. so in the uk we've got this wonderful combination at the moment of rising prices shortage of goods labor shortage and and a harsh immigration policy i mean it's insane I believe we have uh, we have a uh, questions. Which way do we want to go? Uh, in from here in the auditorium or Cecilia? Dr. Cecilia? Let, let's start with a question from uh, our viewers that are online because it it so much goes into what you've just been talking about, and it's really centering not just on the politicians and Washington and, and all of that, but on the politicians at the bishops conference. Um, asking and th this person asks what can american catholics do as an antidote to american church leadership that allies with those that hunker down against welcoming migrants and espouse an apologetic faith void of mercy and welcome that has created a church living in a silo of an us versus them perspective well, I mean, I, I should be asking, there are people here that can probably answer that question much better than me, but I mean, I would just say, looking at the US church from the outside, uh, that you have the really fantastic example in, 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 in El Paso, the border, I mean, so many of the border projects that the church runs here, I find so inspiring. Uh, and you're very involved here at LMU, aren't you, with, with, with one on them. So I, I think um, there's that, that, that is the Catholic Church in the United States, the Church of the Border, Bishop Sites and you know, Brownsville, Texas, and, and those great, the Hope Project. And then there's this other <laughs> side of the Catholic Church, isn't it? Which uh, is seems to be totally tied up with Trumpian rhetoric and so on. How do you bridge that gap? Um, you know, that's a that's a very big question. I, I, think, I think ultimately, um, I mean, again, this is looking from the outside, where is the life in the Catholic Church in the United States? And I've seen it, you know, in those border projects here in the Southwest. I mean, the church is really kind of alive here in a way that I think it's not in the Northeast. It's increasingly sclerotic and so on. And that's true in Europe. You know, the, the dynamic parts of the church in Europe are the ones which are much more open to, to the new thing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, this is a question um, from here in the room. You referred to Francis as humanity's spiritual director. Given that we are at a Jesuit, a Jesuit university, can you explain how the mechanics of St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises informed his views on migration and finding God, um, given this era that we live in of materiality, and, and what, how, how fi that finding God is... Um, pushes us or encourages us beyond imagining ourselves um be, be beyond imagining just ourselves and placing ourselves in the shoes of another yeah oh, well gosh i think spiritual exercises you know runs through so much of what francis thinks and does and says but i would just um uh, hone in on the uh, contemplation of the incarnation in week two of the exercises where where god or actually saint ignatius calls it the holy trinity is looking down you know, from from along from outer space at the world, if you like, uh, and just seeing the pain and the suffering and the need and the longing, and responding with the incarnation, you know, and responding. Obviously, Saint Ignatius doesn't say this, but it always strikes me that the response of God is not a lecture <laughs> or a wonderful book or a program or a political policy. It's the incarnation. So it, it is the enfleshment, the mercy, mercy takes flesh. Um, and so I think that's, that's key. I think Francis looked, and this is of course, partly because of his own history, his own family history, he understands because he grew up with stories of migrants coming from Piedmont. There's a famous story about uh, a, a ship, the Principessa Mafaldesa, which, which, which went down. It was a big uh, disaster uh, from Italy. And his, his grandparents were supposed to be on that boat, but in fact, they got the next one. They had to cancel it for some reason. 
And, you know, that story was always told in his family. So he grew up with these stories of precariousness. So, of course, he has that natural identification with what migrants go through. But I think mostly he, he, has, look, he has done that looking at the world. And he's seen that this is the great issue of our time that, re that calls forth from him uh, the need for, to make the church the leading advocate of migrants in the world, the, the biggest, the largest and most significant advocate for migrants, but also the agent of integration of migrants in the world. And that's where, you know, what happens in the parishes is very important. I said to, by the way, Cardinal Journey, you know, who's, uh, was in charge of the migration section. I actually said to him about that when Francis said in 2015 he wanted every parish to receive a family. I said to Cardinal Jenny, so did you ever do any follow-up? Did you ever ask the bishops of the bishops' conferences, well, how many dioceses, how many parishes? And he said, and he kind of looked at me and said, no, he said, we should have done that. He said, you, you should write a story about that shaming us, you know, and I never have actually, but I, I really think, I think we should follow that up, don't you? I mean, I mean, why doesn't every diocese do an audit? You know, okay, how many parishes in our diocese have had an experience of welcoming the stranger? That is to say, you know, some form of hospitality, you know? Uh, 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 how many? Uh, that would be fascinating to know, wouldn't it? Right, and here in Los Angeles, we're, we're here at one of the very important uh, historically uh, sites of uh, the sanctuary movement in the 1980s, where so many congregations, ecumenically, right, were sites that literally physically received strangers uh, and became prophetic, uh, very public ministries in some cases, but in many cases, uh, untold stories kept quiet because of the fear of uh, re repercussions legally and otherwise. So yes, that, that would be a great opportunity. One of the things I find very moving is the stories of parishes which offer identity cards. Have you heard about this? And I was talking to somebody from Texas, uh, in fact, just yesterday, that, that um, the undocumented migrants get picked up by the police. But if they can show an identity card of their parish, then, then the police kind of go, okay, that's fine, because they just need to see some sort of identification. And I, I was always telling me this story, I said, what do you mean a parish ID? What does that look like? And she pulled it out and it's, it's a proper, you know, plastified identity card with a photo and everything. It looks really good. I, I find that's incredibly moving. You know, the, the parish itself supplies the identity that protects that person from the being spiritual being passport. Disordered. Yeah, right. love it. I love it. Wonderful. Dr. Cecilia? Esta pregunta nos viene del, de la habitación de alguien en nuestro público aquí. Y la voy a, la voy a agrandar un poquito, cambiarla un poquito, porque como has dicho, nos estás viendo desde afuera, ¿no? Y tienes una vista de lo que está pasando en nuestro país. Y la pregunta es acerca de que la migración, ese ha sido tema de campaña política. Y esta ha sido también manipul manipulada para tapar otros problemas. Entonces, ¿cómo funcionamos nosotros, especialmente el público que está involucrado en sus parroquias, etcétera, para poder penetrar eso, ¿no? Y, y, y no dejar que se utilice de esa forma el tema de la migración. Claro, bueno, por, por eso dije ¿no? en la conferencia que hay que constantemente contar la historia real del efecto de la migración y la migración no socava la economía, no quita empleo, ¿no? Eh, a ver, esto es bastante difícil de explicar económicamente, pero es verdad eh, y la historia misma lo, lo muestra. Eh, una de las tácticas eh, más o peores del de de, de nacionalismo populista es tratar de de dividir, digamos, a los obreros o los trabajadores del país, de trabajadores migrantes. Eh, y es cierto que la llegada del, de la mano de obra migrante puede tener un efecto, eh, puede eh, suprimir eh, los salarios. ¿no? Pero en ese caso, lo que hace falta es una campaña en beneficio de todos los trabajadores, no obstante su, su origen. ¿no? Es decir, la iglesia tiene que siempre defender el derecho de todos a un salario digno, a condiciones justas, sea quien sea, ¿no? Que son, y de constantemente recordar la universalidad fraterna contra este intento de dividir la humanidad entre buenos y malos, nacionales, extranjeros, etcétera. 
Magnífico. Y aquí tenemos una pregunta que está muy conectada con lo que acabas de decir. And, and so this is also coming from the room. Um, while growth of society may benefit from migrants, there seems to be a preference in the United States for temporary migrants. Are you concerned about what this does to the family unit? In the United States, the Bracero program destroyed a lot of families, and this person tells us, including mine. Well, you know, you're entering here into, a, into an area of, of, of the migration question in, here in the US, which I don't feel competent to enter into. But what I can say is this, I, I have some familiarity where I live in the UK um, with migrant labor because I live in quite a rural area where there's a lot of agriculture. And actually what happens is that um, these agencies organize uh, workers to come over for six months of the year and they live in caravans uh, and they work incredibly hard. And it's interesting now as a result of Brexit, they're no longer coming from Europe or Eastern Europe. They're now coming from Tajikistan and Kazakhstan and places, incredibly poor places. And these people are tough as nails. They work incredibly hard and they take back hard cash with them to their countries and you know to say to them you know you can't come because your wife and your family needs you it just seems to me you know no i mean they're making a very conscious decisions about what's good for them you know so I, that's why i hesitate to make those kinds of judgments but of course the family it, you know ultimately we need an economy which is able to uh, uh, have a certain number of migrants arriving safely and being integrated and their whole families coming. I mean, that obviously is the, the, the right way of, uh, of going, but I think there will always be seasonal workers. That's not something that bothers me particularly. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Right, no, exactly. As long as we go back to what you said about the, the rights of workers. Yes, exactly. Yeah, as long as they're not being exploited, yeah. That's right. okay. Here we have a, another question from our online audience. And this one goes, back to uh, the paradigm that you presented. So how do you think that the two lenses of sacrifice versus mercy map themselves onto the divisions and polarization within the church itself? And how do we heal our divided hearts if we're tugged both ways because we grew up in a church of laws demanding perfection? Wow, that's a very, very profound question. Um, I was actually going to, but I, I took it out because it would have made it too long, but I was going to begin tonight's talk with a story about um, how just after Christmas, I was denounced on one of those websites, which the American church seems to specialize in, uh, where, where, where rich people pay angry people to, to, to criticize the church for not being, you know, tough enough or whatever. Anyway, the, 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 they had objected to a tweet of mine of two years ago, two years ago, uh, on, on the, uh, the Massacre of the Innocents, when I had tweeted about migration, because you know, the flight into Egypt, obviously, is about. And I was told in this article they, they were, that, I, that what I was trying to do was move the narrative away from abortion onto immigration, right? Which I found extraordinary for all sorts of reasons, but without getting into the arguments or whatever, what an extraordinary idea that you could take a gospel passage and say, no, it's about that, but not about that. You know? Now, that's a good example of the, of the hermeneutic of sacrifice. Again, the gospel passage of, the, of, of Herod ordering the massacre of the innocents is obviously about power and the death of, it could be about the death of the unborn or the death of innocent life. But surely it's also about immigration because it's the flight into Egypt. So I think that a lot of, uh, in the church, we often have the hermeneutic of sacrifice in play. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, if you concentrate on that, that means you're weakening, you know, your witness to that. And that, of course, has happened a lot in this country because part of the Catholic Church has basically become allied to a particular Republican Party agenda. Um, so that the focus of ethical concern has been abortion and gay marriage and that kind of thing to the exclusion of everything else. And that has been disastrous for the church's credibility. And one of the big things that Francis has done since 2013 has been to move, attempt <laughs> to move the Bishop's Conference away from those kinds of uh, addiction to certain kinds of issues. And I think by putting, you know, just the way he's put immigration, 
uh, climate change, gun control, and the death penalty at the center of what has to be the church's proclamation. You know, the church, people will only take the, ch the church's witness to the gospel seriously if they see it in its integrity. We care about the unborn. We care about the rainforest. We care about the plight of the migrant. We sure as hell care about, uh, uh, you know, gun massacres. You know, we care about all of those things because human dignity is trashed in each of those instances. And once you start to say, oh, no, no, you know, it's fine to hold guns and have the death penalty because what really matters is abortion, then people, it's just nobody takes it seriously. So, no, rant over. <laughs> the, and, and just briefly, the uh, um, yeah. it's being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, good the, evening, good evening, Archbishop. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, well, and including just this past week, uh, Francis in the interview with uh, Associated Press making comments that were very well received by the LGBTQ community, right? Uh, and without Point, without pointing a finger at uh, church authorities in the United States, he didn't have to point the finger directly. He was talking about a global situation of homophobia and laws that are still on the books that prescribe uh, expressions of, of, of same-sex love. Uh, he took a, yet another step further, it seems. Yeah, I mean, I mean and what he's right? doing there, he's not, he's not changing church teaching. What he's doing is clarifying what ch church teaching actually says. There is no church teaching which is in any way in favor of the criminalization of homosexuality. In fact, Latin countries, Catholic countries, decriminalized homosexuality long before, by the way, Protestant Anglo-Saxon countries. You know, we, we sometimes very myopic in that way. But the, and the other important clarification, I think the other kind of important clarification that he was making, um, you know, was about was about the kind of, uh, yes, sure, any, any non-marital, you know, sexual activity is sinful in the church's moral teaching. But you know, we're not we're not singling out that particular kind of relationship more than any other, and I think that was a very important message. You know, James Martin sent him a a, a letter saying, "Could you clarify?" And he sent a letter back, and I, I'm not going to try and summarize it because I'm a bit tired. But um, you know, just nuances, uh, and that is partly you know that's what Francis does. He he rescues the heart of the teaching, and he says, "This is what the church teaches." All this other stuff that has accrued around it. That's not church teaching. And that's partly what the Pope's job is, is to clarify teaching. But everybody goes, oh, but it's, you know, he has no right to change the catechism. Well, actually the catechism is a, is a, text, is a text that is constantly developing. Uh, and in fact, Popes are often clarifying things which then later get reflected in the catechism. That's not new. Thank you. Do we have uh, something else from the internet? Like moving away from migration there. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Well, uh I, I think we do have a theme, right, with the United States being, you know, under the microscope here in terms of our issues. And this one comes from the room. Um, why did Fratelli Tutti receive a hard criticism from Catholics when Pope Francis called children of God non-baptized people that are not Catholics? This scandalized many Catholics. What does that say about the church? So uh, that that Pope Francis called everyone children of God, right? Non-baptized and 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 that people were scandalized by this. I don't remember. He said that in That's what. La gente se escandaliza por muchas cosas. ¿no? Yo, no, yo no conozco ninguna doctrina de la iglesia que hace esa distinción. Yo creo que hijos, hijos de Dios son, bueno, todos, todos somos hijos de Dios en el sentido de que todos somos creados por Dios y amados por Él en ese sentido. Somos hijos. ¿no? Algo que se llama el imago de ¿verdad? <laughs> Hechos en la imagen de Dios. Um, eh, este viene desde el público en el internet. Um, Creo que es más una esperanza que una pregunta, pero 
cree que los millones de católicos estadounidenses despertaremos un día de estos unidos y salgamos a la calle a pedir una reforma justa migratoria. Una, una reforma de inmigratoria, de la sí. política inmigratoria. Bueno, no sé, no, no sé, ojalá, ¿no? Eh, ahora, es, eh, en los Estados Unidos tiene, o sea, tiene esa experiencia de la inmigración, está en todas las historias de las familias. Así que si hay un país que debería ser un faro para la humanidad eh, sobre esta cuestión, es, es este país. Que ha, ha sido el, el gran ejemplo de, ¿no? de, de la, del, del crecimiento económico, de una democracia, de una, de una sociedad vigorosa, dinámica, fruto de la integración de elementos diversos como resultado de una política abierta de inmigración. Y hay que recuperar esa tradición. ¿no? Bueno, eh, and, and, uh, siguiendo con el tema de, de, de una esperanza de que sí se pueden cambiar las cosas, I just wanted to uh, pick up on this, one of the themes uh, late in your talk about Francis um, being somber and kind of dark before the, just before the pandemic. Well, you know, God knows that the darkness, a scream of darkness had come across the land with certain elections of certain figures. Um, and that he saw light in this period. I, I don't think I'm alone in saying that there, uh, with, with the reckon, there was a light in the darkness with the reckoning in the United States that it is ongoing, of course, but there's also a sense among many people that there was a missed opportunity, that the early part of the pandemic, a light shone very bright we can come together as, you know, across all kinds of divides. We were cheering on the first responders. We were all masking most of us, right? We were looking out for the other. Uh, we, were, we were living this gospel, um, but it was, it was a flash of a moment. And it seemed like the retrenchment into the polarized position came really fast. Um, does Francis have anything to say? <laughs> as a consolation to the sense that we missed a great opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't spoken to him about how he sees things now. So when I spoke to him was in 2020. So it was in the midst of the pandemic. And it wasn't that he was optimistic, but what he, had, what he, what he, he had seen this shared vulnerability, which the pandemic had exposed, the way it had shone a light on inequalities and exclusions and that these things were finally being discussed and looked at, he saw as a sign of hope. But I think he, certainly listening to him recently, um, he, I think, does believe that in many ways we have missed the opportunity of the pandemic. There is that feeling, I think, in him. There's, I can tell there's that kind of frustration. Um, I mean, the reason for his, his uh, somber outlook on, on, on the future was precisely because he saw the, what's described in the first chapter of Fratelli Tutti, as a world which was all those things that happened after the war, those agreements, those multilateral institutions, you know, all now becoming fragmented, uh, um, uh, the European Union, NATO, and, so on. and he foresaw Putin's invasion of Ukraine, not obviously that it would happen on that date, but he, was, he has been predicting for a number of years uh, a, a war, and of course, de facto, there has been a war going on. So this idea that actually life is becoming increasingly violent, in many ways, there are a lot of comparisons here between now and the 1920s and 30s, which gave rise to you know, fascism and the war. Now, histor history never repeats itself exactly, but I think you can see many, many of the same conditions. So I think we're in this very, I think Francis sees this as a very delicate moment where we have this temptation uh, to slide into this but on the other hand we don't seem to be quite there yet you know trump lost the election bolsonaro lost the election you know <laughs> we're not there yet but it's on a knife edge thank you and we have a question here that goes a little bit to this as well this is from the room and i'm just going to summarize it because they seem to be asking if you think that we need crisis to bring us into unity or if there are other ways for us to find each other? That's a really great question. Um, I, I mean, I think if you, look, if you look at your own life, right, and you look at the life of your country and the 
uh, when are we not in crisis? You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, it seems to me that that is that is the way we grow is through crises. You know? uh, I mean, a crisis is is because something is no longer capable of continuing the way it has been, um, and that's why it, an institution or our own lives or whatever enter or our relationships enter into crisis. And a crisis, therefore, is always an opportunity to, to have to re review and renegotiate. So uh, from his point of view, from the point of view of, uh, of his role as spiritual director of humanity, I think he would see all these crises, the environmental, the migration crisis, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, all these different crises as exposing uh, things that need to be addressed. And but do hold an opportunity for us to come together. And he really sees that as the great question of our time, which is why you know, he wrote Fratelli Tutti, because the challenges that humanity now faces are ones that cannot be resolved at a local or national level. They require a very, very large level of international cooperation. They require us becoming a people, as he says in Let's Dream, uh, to recover our sense of a people. So really, that's why that's why this is really a, a, an important moment in the history of humanity. You know, unless we find that capacity for fraternity, things do look very bleak. On the other hand, <laughs> the crisis itself forces us to look at that, uh, the way we live. I mean, the environmental question uh, you know, poses the big question, how we live uh, on this planet. You know, uh, war and violence raises the question of how we relate to each other. Yeah, you've had George Floyd and the racist. Right? Again, all these all these crises expose things which need to be addressed, and therefore are also an opportunity. And from a spiritual point of view, they are. God is always there. God never abandons us, but rather offers us the grace of conversion precisely in the crisis itself. That's what I've learned from him, and I, it's actually kind of changed in many ways my outlook on life, or oh, even on my own life. You know, he's had a big effect on me in that sense. Oh. Where is, where is the grace of conversion in this crisis? Well, that's what I call wounded grace in my own writing. You can read that. <laughs> um, um, it, here's a question that I think speaks to, to one of our global crises that, that a lot of us are trying to pay attention to, but we may not have as many allies as we wish, which is, that like all migrants, women migrants suffer, very often they suffer so much more because they're bringing children with them, they're pregnant, they're, they're vulnerable, they're vulnerable to sexual assault, et cetera. So has Pope Francis addressed the particular suffering of women migrants? Well, the answer is yes, because he's off, he often singles out women when he is talking about what migrants go through, uh, so yeah. No, and there's no question that uh, that what women suffer in migration uh, is is of a different nature from what men uh, suffer, and their vulnerability is so much greater. Absolutely. So, so here's one question that's coming again from our internet audience, and they want to know what you think about if having a Catholic president is making any difference in all this for the United States. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gosh, um, well, I, I mean, I, <laughs> my, I suppose with Biden, we just feel um, it's so wonderful not to have Trump. Um, it's a bit, it's a bit like actually in the UK, we now have an, a grown-up as prime minister after these extraordinary adolescents who seem to have taken over. So there's this kind of we want we want to canonize these people because they're not the people that you know, that, that that came before them. Um, so I, I I think I'm going to avoid that question. I mean I I do think Biden, uh, as a Catholic, brings certain qualities to his leadership, and you see it, you know, uh, that he's that Catholic of that kind of worker generation. That that Catholic social teaching means a lot to him. He has I think that um, enormous kind of pastoral capacity to deal with uh, pain, you know. I, so there are all those things I admire about him, which I think are very much fruit of this faith. Um, but on terms of policies and stuff, I, I, I prefer not to go there. Well, and certainly the United States is not built in a way that he could act on, on many of these. Well, you... Exactly. I mean, one of the things that I think people, some of our more conservative friends in the church, sometimes you know, they, they live in this fantasy of Christendom where you seize power and then impose more doctrines through the law well 
that's called theocracy. That's not democracy. Um, and uh, I mean, I know again in the UK, Tony Blair, for example, became a Catholic after he was prime minister, even though he wanted to before. He, he very much saw himself as a Catholic, but he just couldn't because he would have been shot down on all sides. Um, uh, uh, he wouldn't have lasted five minutes. So I think we have to understand that politicians have to live in the realm of the possible. Uh, and I think we need to give more respect. And it's very, very important that we respect the politician's conscience, just as our own conscience. We have to, a well-informed conscience knows how to act in a particular circumstance. Uh, and if our politicians are simply automatons who are responding to orders, whether that's the electorate or bishops or whatever, then they're not being true politicians. Uh, a politician is somebody who needs to, uh, to have a good conscience and, and to use it. So I think we need a greater respect for the conscience of politicians. I, I, uh, he's not a politician, but I, I just like to put in a plug for Stephen Colbert, who's uh, we see every night. Yes. And uh, here in the United States, he's got a lot more airtime than President Biden yes, does. The, the nation's <laughs> most famous Catholic, as he describes himself. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And a sensibility that I think does come through. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Very much yeah, so. I think he, he, he evangelizes, doesn't he? Partly. Yes. And yes. he's, uh, if the Supreme Court's on the side of the hermeneutic of sacrifice, he's the. On the other side, for mercy. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have one more? A well, this more? is actually coming from my own curiosity because you pointed out that we have this these wonderful papal documents, but we don't have one on migration yet. Do you see any possibility that that's in the works? Yeah, funny enough, one has been predicted for some time, um, but I'm not sure because, as I, as I said in the in the talk. Uh, it runs through all the my, all his documents. You know, it keeps appearing in all the documents. In a way, I think it because it is so fundamental to the gospel. Uh, it, it underpins the documents. Um, of course, he could easily do an encyclical. I mean, uh, the, the migrant section in the Vatican, by the way, if you go onto it, they've collected everything Francis has said on the topic, uh, and they have this version online. But they also have a PDF. Right, which is a, it's a book basically on the PDF. Only goes up to 2019, and it's already 580 pages. Right? So, I mean, we're talking here about, I mean, if there were an encyclical, it would be by far, you know, it, would be, it could be enormous. So I suppose that the question is, what would be gained by an encyclical? In other words, is there a teaching there that, that we haven't yet heard that we would? And so I'm not sure, actually, because in a way he's done the encyclical not just through what he said, but through his gestures, through the, the, the choices he's made on, on his trips. Um, you call it an encyclical of encyclical gestures, of gestures in, in yeah. your talk. Yeah, right? that's right. And I, and, I think so. and, I, and I think it's also very important for him that migration should not be reduced to a document, precisely because it is, it is an incarnation question. You know, we meet the stranger in the person. So it's when Francis goes to Lesbos and he, or he cries with the Rohingya, you know, that's the encyclical. And it's, and it, boy, unlike most of the encyclicals, it gets splashed on the front pages and it annoys people like Salvini and Trump. So, in a way, it's far more effective than, than his, than, you know, than a written document. Embodied gestures. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, do, do we have, uh, are, are we, we, we we're have winding? Been, uh, we have, well, we have a, 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 at this point, we've answered a lot of the questions okay. that have come through. Yeah. Um, I, following up on what you just said, you know, one of the things that I, I get excited about talking to my undergraduates is the change Pope Francis made to the catechism on capital punishment, yes. uh, which which is enormous. And, and it is a way for us to show, right, the, the evolution and, and the transformation of something uh, that really has major uh, global significance. Um, would something like that uh, come along in terms of migration, right? Well, yes. I mean, what, what happened in the case of the death penalty was that the catechism was, of course, developed. It was it, it, the teaching actually developed. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way that was very important uh, and that had an immediate impact because famously in the United States, certain Catholics used John Paul II's actually very tiny concession 
wasn't it? John Paul basically said the death penalty is inadmissible except in circumstances where there's a kind of civic breakdown. And that was used by certain Catholics to say, oh, yeah, oh, you know, in my state, this murderer has basically caused a civic breakdown, so the death penalty is okay. In fact, all they heard was the death penalty was okay. So that door had to be closed, and Francis has now closed it. Um, but I don't think there's any doubt on where the church stands on migration. I think actually the church on migration has been amazingly consistent uh, throughout the decades, and that teaching has developed, and I tried to show how, but I don't think there's any kind of confusion about it. And that's why uh, I'm not sure whether a any kind of clarification is really necessary. I mean, one of the things that Francis did enter into after a couple of years of the pontificate was the question of integration, because I think that became a major question. You know, it wasn't just a, welcoming is not just opening borders. It's also about reception and integration. And so I think that his approach has become more sort of sophisticated as he's entered into dialogue also with, with politicians. But, you know, the basic contours of that teaching, I think, remain incredibly clear, incredibly compelling. And I think it's one of the great witnesses that the Catholic Church gives independently of Pope Francis in the world is on this very topic, because it's where the gospel, you know, the, the, the gospel hits the road, as it were, uh, uh, and particularly now. And that's why it's so, so important. And that's why it's so wonderful that you have this lecture, this commitment in the, in the university. Um, and so I want to thank you for, for having me, for inviting me to share this with you. Um, and just, you know, I speak as an admirer of so much that the church here does. It's an inspiration to us in Europe. Uh, and please, uh, please carry on. Okay, thank you thank very much. Y quisiera yeah. brevemente agradecer a los intérpretes también por su gran labor. Por supuesto. So to show the hermeneutic of mercy embodied here, we are going to say good night. <laughs> You've had a long day here on campus. Two addresses to us. Thank you for your presence, your work on this tremendous theme.